Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a This Year in Perfume episode and it is all the way on the year 2001. So we're kind of entering the modern age or very close to it. I consider everything 20 years and, and before as vintage. So we're getting close to talking about perfumes that are no longer considered to be vintage in the next couple episodes. These are still, I guess, technically vintage if you would like. Um, but um, this is a, a ranked video, so as I always tell you guys, in my ranked videos, don't forget, I'm not saying that number 10 is worse than number 1, I'm not saying that number 2 is better than number 9, I'm just saying that uh, these are my personal choices at this point in time. Also, it's the end of October here in Texas, we're uh, still relatively warm as Texas is, uh, you know, uh, stubborn to give up the ghost of hot weather. But uh, we're starting to get a little cooler weather from time to time, especially in the evenings and the mornings. And so, you know, some of my rankings, let's say, maybe have been influenced by that. If I had done this list in the middle of summer, maybe one of the, you know, warmer weather scents would have jumped a spot or two. But just keep that in mind. It is a living, breathing list. My uh, opinions obviously can change. So we're all the way to the year 2001. And so let's talk a little bit about the history of 2001. I don't think uh, anyone has to be reminded of the biggest event, which was the 9-11 attacks. And then, of course, uh, the United States instantly invading Afghanistan, which was, I think, kind of sold as we're just going to go in there and, um, you know, get the guys who did this and be out quickly. And it turned into a 20 plus year war, uh, the longest war in American history. And, um, you know, 9-11 for me is, uh, while well, I was in high school at the time, I, of course, everyone remembers where you were during the 9-11 attacks. I remember being in the classroom and the teachers rolling in the TV. They used to have these TVs on stands that they could, like, roll into the classroom. Do they even do that anymore? Do they just, like, pull up their iPad or, um, but back then they had, like, big old school TVs on stands and they rolled the TV in and plugged it in. We sat and watched the news broadcast all day. Uh, and I remember one of the girls that, I actually very briefly dated, uh, one of those awkward high school date, you know, date, uh, dating, um, you know, uh, like Valentine's day, uh, you know, we went to a dance or something, but her father was a airline pilot. I just remember this look of dread on her face cause she didn't know where he was. Of course, luckily he ended up being okay, but, um, they used 9-11 to then go forward and put out the Patriot Act, which took more of Americans' rights away. And so it seems like uh, Americans were kind of always willing to trade away more of their rights for the illusion of safety, if you will. And of course, that led to the next couple de decade or two of the war on terror and, um, you know, the threat level orange and red and always keeping the uh, citizens on their toes and... Um, there's different ways I think that the ruling class stays in power, but one way is to always have kind of an enemy that the, um, the country can sort of rally behind before terrorism. It was the Russians and, uh, it was the communist threat, right? And so this 9-11 kind of brought us into the new age, if you will. And I really think that, um, you know, 9-11, uh, is kind of one of those events that for me anyways, took us past the age of innocence. The 90s almost seemed, at least in the West, almost like a carefree decade, right? Uh, the the Berlin Wall had fallen a decade ago. Um, w once you're in the 90s or so, uh, you know, with Reagan making his tear down this wall speech, and then it just seemed like in the, uh, after the Berlin Wall fell and communists fell, it just seemed like America kind of found itself sitting atop of the world, and it really didn't have any challengers. And it was a very carefree time in the West, and, um, you know, that, that carefree style was almost like shaken. Uh, it, it's almost like 9-11 was like a wake-up call for the average citizen who's paying attention. There's still a lot of, I think, citizens who are asleep nowadays. But, um, you know, if, you're, if you were paying attention, I think 9-11 was like a wake-up call. It was the welcome to the modern age. And, um, you know, it was kind of one of those events that no one who was alive at the time who saw it will forget. But... There were other things that happened in the year 2001 uh, that, of course, um, led to other terrorist attacks like anthrax attacks. There were rolling blackouts in California. Um, there was a um, there was a shoe bomber, apparently, that ended up bringing attempted to blow up an American airline plane. You might remember that dubbed as the shoe bomber. 
Um, there, there was, there were other things that happened, rolling blackouts in California and stuff like that. Um, but the, the other big one that really jumps into my mind is the death of, uh, Dale Earnhardt in the final lap. You know, it's a, it's a 500 mile, uh, race in a circle, of course. And on the final lap, he, um, was in a, was in a wreck and ended up dying from it, passed away. He a legendary race car driver. Uh, I drive actually on Dale Earnhardt Road every day to kind of get to work because I drive right past Texas Motor Speedway to, to go to the office that I work in. And so, you know, the name Dale Earnhardt is I'm constantly kind of reminded of that event. Um, I'm not the biggest race fan, but uh, he's kind of one of the legendary ones that you have to acknowledge. I think he won something like seven NASCAR championships or something like that. So, um, so yes, that was, uh, that was 2001 in a nutshell. That kind of gets us in the frame of mind. Um, I think Tony Blair was elected again in the United Kingdom. Uh, you know, the British Labor Party elected him for a second term at the time. He's always tied to the hip to, to George Bush. Um, uh, George Bush, um, George W. Bush. And so 2001 is kind of one of those watershed years in, in, um, in Western history. So let's get back to fragrances, but that kind of gets us in the mood of uh, what was going on in, in, in 2001. Most people know all that, but just kind of a quick refresher course to get us in the mood to set the tone. So let's do scent of the day, and then we'll talk about some fragrances from the year 2001 in my collection. So the first one is a fragrance from, um, well... Scent of the day, of course, not really the first one, but this is one that I actually uh, have been putting off doing a review of because it's such an iconic, important fragrance that I almost feel like I uh, am not worthy to do the review yet. I really feel like I have to sit and be in the right frame of mind and formulate my thoughts because this is one of those Hall of Fame fragrances. I think it's one of the greatest oriental fragrances ever released. It came out in 1977. It was done by Jean-Louis Suizac and Jean Amic. Uh, and also Raymond Chailin apparently helped build the top of this fragrance, specifically that mandarin orange top note uh, in here was created by Raymond Chailin. And this is YSL's Opium. So this is the uh, original bottle. This is what the original bottle looked like, the old Charles of the Ritz uh, distributor. And you can see that they used to make these back in the day in a splash like this, which they do not do anymore. The bottle is absolutely iconic. Um, the name is iconic. The name was kind of a uh, uh, one of those things that people talked about. Like it was kind of one of those, uh, to think in 1977, naming something as simple as a perfume opium was risque, right? Because some people said, oh, you're naming it after a drug. Oh my, you know, fine society will not stand for this. And, you know, others absolutely loved it. Uh, there was a huge party when Opium was launched. And of course, uh, Yves Saint Laurent was famous for his uh, parties and how wild they got and all the crazy things that happened. But uh, it, it literally, to me, I think is one of the greatest fragrances of all time. And of course, going back to my video from yesterday, if you watched my video yesterday, you know that um, we talked a little bit about Cote's Emerald, which came out in 1921, and then Shalimar was officially released in 25. There are some people who say Shalimar was technically created in 21, but it didn't get released until 25. I'm not going to go into all that, but um, basically, uh, go watch my video on Emerald if you want to have some conversation about borrowing ideas in the fragrance world and is sort of an idea, is there ever really anything new, a new idea in the fragrance world? Because this is very, very similar to a creation by Estee Lauder called Youth Do from the 1950s. So that's decades before opium. But opium was uh, really a trend center. I, I absolutely love it. I love the resins. I've been wearing it today. I mean, uh, I had the, the spices, the, um, the, the clove, the fruity notes, the resins, the apopanax and myrrh and frankincense. It is slightly smoky. Imagine being in an opium den. Uh, you're going to have some smoke there. Some uh, Just imagine resins burning. Imagine the smoke wafting. But just imagine this uh, extremely resinous tolu balsam and benzoin and very warm fragrance with animalic notes. The labdanum is very prominent. It's somewhat leathery, but it also feels like there's some castorium in here as well. Even though there's no um, animalic note listed, 
I think there's some castorium in here. Um, and so this has been reformulated. Obviously, the newer stuff does not smell like the original Charles of the Ritz bottles, but I am absolutely in love with this fragrance, and, and I will review it one of these days. I just have to kind of build up the nerve. Okay, so this video is actually going to be a top 11, okay? So it's going to be a top 11 countdown, but before we get into the top 11, I want to do two honorable mentions. One, two samples that I have that I'll be doing videos on very soon. One, um, I can't find the sample of, so... I can't show you, but you'll have to take my word for it. It's Perfuma Roma's Dolces Infundo, um, which is a, I believe, vanilla fragrance, if I'm not mistaken. And um, Dolces Infundo came out in 2001, of course. So it's like vanilla and Sicilian citrus fruits is basically what it is. It's supposed to be like a gourmand take on a vanilla, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I apparently I have a sample floating around somewhere. I just can't find it. So... Um, I can't show it to you, but I will, once I once I find it, there'll be a video on that one of these days. And then the other one, which is really a shock to me how much I like this, is a fragrance from the house of La Occitane, which I don't own any of their fragrances, but I have smelled Eau de Beau in the shops, and I really like it. This is the other one I really like from the house. It's called um, Eau de Vetiver. So they have Eau de Beau. Uh, they also have Eau de Vetiver. They just wrote La Occitane Vetiver on here, but... Um, it's actually Eau de Vetiver, um, just like it's technically La Occitane in Provence, but uh, we'll, we'll leave that alone for now. So it's kind of a woody, spicy vetiver, take on a vetiver, but it's also a very clean and fresh vetiver. So if you like cleaner vetivers, like if you like Creed's original vetiver, or you know even another fragrance from 2001 that came out called M Mugler Cologne, if you, that's discontinued, I believe. Um, but as is this, this is also discontinued, but this is a great vetiver fragrance. It's um, kind of uh, spicy, a little bit medicinal, um, you know, it almost feels like there's some fresh green sharp notes in there, but the spices, the nutmeg really blend with the um, vetiver in a, in a brilliant manner. I think this is an amazing vetiver fragrance no one talks about. So one of these days I will get around to reviewing La Occitane Eau de Vetiver. So I'm not going to put that in the ranking because I don't have a bottle. But um, it's, a, it's a very good vetiver composition from top to bottom, in my opinion. Okay, next on the list is, uh, well, actually first on the list now, since we're going to go to the top 11 countdown. So number 11 on the list is a discontinued, actually very hard to find inexpensive fragrance from the house of Trussardi. And this is called Trussardi Python for Men. Okay, so this is coming in at number 11 for me. And the reason it's coming in at number 11 um, is not necessarily because it's a bad fragrance, but it's just the more that I've worn this fragrance, the more boring it seems, if that makes sense. Like when I spray this on and try to get to know it and stuff like that, um, there are very unique notes in here. Louise Turner is the perfumer for um, Python for Men. She made Le Mal Le Parfum from 2020, which I actually don't hate. Uh, I'll review that one of these days. I have a sample floating around. Uh, probably one of my favorite Lamal flankers outside of the um, very hard to find Lamal. Um, uh, this one right here is uh, Essence de Parfum from Lamal. So Essence de Parfum and then the one Louise Turner did in 2020, uh, Le Parfum, are, are probably two of the stronger flankers. The rest, are, especially the new one that comes in the gold bottle, Elixir, I think it's trash. Um, Lost Cherry she did for Tom Ford. Um, so Louise Turner has done some things. She did Fahrenheit 32, which I would love to smell. I've never smelled Fahrenheit 32. She did Fougere d'Argent by Tom Ford. I've never smelled that one. She did the new Cherry Smoke by Tom Ford as well. Um, and so she's been around the block a little while, but she really doesn't have very many hits that I like. Actually, she doesn't have any hits that I like, to be honest with you. Um... This is the only full bottle I think that she has done that I that I own a full bottle of, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to go through her lineup and look a little harder to verify that statement, but I think this is the only thing she's done that I have a full bottle of. And um, this is kind of one of her uh, works that gets overlooked. And I can completely see why, because it really has these very unique notes. Like, for example, there's tea tree bark and mulch in the top so um 
and it's mixed with cypress leaf. And if you know my taste, I absolutely love cypress. Um, I think it's underused in masculine perfumery. I wish more fragrances use that cypress. It's a little bit like pine, but sort of herbal, medicinal, almost like a, it has a little bit of a, a cleaning type quality to it. There's a cleanliness to cypress somehow, like you're standing in a forest inhaling cold air, and it just has this sort of cleanly you know, when you when you smell it, it just feels like the cold has disinfected everything to me. That's how cypress smells. And it's mixed with the note of olive, okay? So unique notes already. Tea, tree bark and mulch, olive, cypress leaf, and it's in the base is bourbon vetiver, teak wood, musk, and tonka bean. But the more I've worn it, the more I realize that the musk in the base really feels amped up. Like it feels like a white musk overdose, if you will. And so these other notes that are seem unique, like olive and stuff like that, if you get them, you get them for a very fleeting moment and then they're kind of gone. And it really feels like, um, um, it just feels a little bland and boring on, on, on the nose to me. I still like the fragrance. I think it's great for summer when you can just kind of spray away, but I don't think it's worth the big price tag that this is going for nowadays, especially on eBay and stuff like that. So my version is the Scannon version. There's also another version that came after this. I forget, Selective Beauty or something. I don't think it matters which version you have. I think they're both very, very similar to each other. Um, so even though there is some unique notes to this fragrance, I think the overall sort of dry down is just a little bit bland for me. So that's why this came in at number 11, Trussardi's Python for Men. I'll, I'll do a full review one of these days. Um, next on the list is a Paco Rabanne fragrance, and it's from, of course, 2001, or it wouldn't be on this list. Uh, this is Paco Rabanne's Ultraviolet Man. So Ultraviolet Man, uh, I thought was discontinued for the longest time. It's not. So it's actually um, still available for purchase. Uh, I think maybe Parfumo showed discontinued for a little bit and then they took it away. It was created by Jacques Cavalier and this is actually not a bad scent. It's uh, Russian coriander, Italian mint, ambergris, black pepper, crystallized moss, and patchouli. And so there is a little bit of this strange crystallized green feeling to the fragrance. Either it's the coriander or it's the crystallized moss note in the base. The problem is, is that it's very, very sweet and synthetic smelling. And so I, um, I could completely see somebody smelling this and being put off by the sweetness, which happens to me a lot of the time. That's the reason it's number 10 on the list or that synthetic quality to the creation. But I don't hate the scent. That's the thing. I mean, I, I, um, I own a bottle, so I don't necessarily hate the scent, but it is extremely sweet. I wish they somehow turned the sweetness down a bit. But um, it's it's not a bad fragrance for a designer like this. If you can find it for 30, 40 bucks, it's not bad. Uh, so that's number 10, Paco Rabanne's Ultraviolet Man. Number nine. Number nine is a Serge Luton. And it's probably one of the more overlooked Serge Luton fragrances. It only has one note. And that's the note of Detora. And the name is Detora Noir. Noir. And so Detora Noir is still available for purchase. Um, and it's kind of a floral, slightly sweet, slightly powdery, white floral smell is what Detora smells like. It's um, a member of the Nightshade family, okay? And um, so Detora can actually have some, you know, Nightshade can be poisonous in some situations and it can have some um, dangerous side effects, okay? So this is also known as, Detora is also known as Angel's Trumpet, and um, it is a plant that in many cultures is kind of prioritized as sacred, okay? So what's interesting about this fragrance, though, is if you're someone who does not like white florals, like if you're someone that's like, whoa, that jasmine note isn't for me, or that tuberose note isn't for me, check this out. Uh, because Detour Noir kind of just does things a little bit differently, I would say. So um, it is a sweet um, it is a sweet white floral, but, um, it's, it's slightly powdery, um, and, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, very heady. It's a very kind of, uh, one of those flowers that 
uh, just feels like it takes up a lot of space in the composition, right? And I'm sure there's other things in here than just Datura. I doubt there's only Datura flower in here, but um, if you're interested in kind of smelling uh, a white floral that smells a little different, there's a slight honeyed quality to this as well. It's a very heady kind of um, white flower smell. Give this a try. Give Detour Noir a try. If anyone can do a fragrance like this justice, it's Serge Luton. So that's number nine, Serge Luton's uh, Detour Noir. Number eight is a Dior fragrance. And this is probably one of the most overlooked Dior fragrances for men. This and Dune, right? So I really feel like Dune in the late 90s and then higher in, in 2001 are two of the masculine releases from Dior that just got completely overlooked or they just got glossed over somehow. You know, they get sandwiched between the big hitters. So, you know, if you take um, something like Fahrenheit from the late 80s, or you take Dior's Jules from the early 80s, or you take uh, some of the later releases that really caught fire, like Sauvage and stuff like that, that Dior put out, um, Higher just kind of got sort of over, uh, pushed to the side. It got overlooked, right? And, and it does kind of feel like a high-tech fragrance to me. It feels like a very modern, futuristic fragrance. You know, the um, the way that the marketing was sort of uh, portrayed gives it a very modern, almost like a Apple iPad or Apple iPod, you know, type white color right here, which I also said with another release um, from the house of Gucci. Gucci Rush has a little bit of that white sort of clean, app white, you know, if you remember the old iPod. By the way, in 2001, another thing that happened was iTunes was released for the very first time. So, you know, just think about that white, clean, crisp, you know, line. Uh, it was it was revolutionary when Google came out, too, because they only had the, the search bar and all this white space around it. And if you remember some of the other engines, Yahoo and stuff like that, they had all this clutter on the screen. And so early in... Um, when all that started to change over, cleanliness and simplicity and design was a big thing, right? And so this is a very citrusy, fresh type fragrance that uses the note of pear and it um, sort of pairs, it pairs the pear note with pear tree wood, okay? So there's pear and there's pear tree wood in here. Uh, and so while this is not a fragrance that I think if you're in the beast mode, if you're someone that wants some of the scents with the molecules that are going to last 20 plus hours on your skin, you won't like this. If you're like, what's the C, if the first question you ask when I talk about a fragrance is what's the sillage and longevity like, this is not for you. But if you're someone who likes refinement, especially if you're looking for maybe a citrusy fragrance for men that operates a little different than what you're used to smelling, and I do say for men specifically because there is a spicy cypress note in here that really keeps this leaning masculine, even though the citruses and, um, you know, the white musk dry down, I think makes it completely unisex. Anyone can easily wear this. I, I think this would smell amazing on a woman, but traditionally that sort of rosemary, which can come across as a little bit oily, the spices and the cypress note, which I mentioned earlier, um, I mentioned the cypress note earlier in Python for Men, um, I think keep it relatively to the masculine side of things, right? But it's a very fresh citrusy. That pear note is very succulent, very juicy, and very photorealistic pear. Uh, I like higher. I think it's underrated. Um, I think it's underrated, and it's one of the Dior's that, along with um, Dior's Dune Pour Homme, I think really kind of gets overlooked. It gets lost in the shuffle of masculine perfumery, but higher's one that is worth checking out if you're looking for a summer type fragrance for men. Okay, next on the list, we have number seven. So number seven, we're gonna go to, we're actually gonna go to all three of these because this is the original Clive Christian launch box. Well, not the original one, but the original groupings of fragrances that came out in the year 2001 when Clive Christian launched the brand. And so this actually has three fragrances. We're gonna talk about all three since they were launched in 2001. Um, the first one on the list is going to be 1872, okay? Um, but there's also number one and X for men. Those are all on the list. They all came out in 2001 when Clive Christian launched the brand. So 1872 says, 
Virility is given a delicate and refined touch in this complex of deep woody texture, textures infused with a gentle spice. So 1872, when you look at the note listing, uh, it's a huge, gigantic note listing. There's a ton of things listed. Galbanum, bergamot, petit gras, lavender, lime, peach, pineapple, rosemary, grapefruit, mandarin orange, nutmeg, pepper. That's the top. Clary sage, cyclamen, um, tajits, freesia, jasmine in the heart, cedar, musk, labdanum, patchouli, amber, and frankincense in the base. Okay, Giza Schoen is the perfumer of um, two out of the three of these. And uh, 1872 for men, when I first smelled it, the very first thing that came to mind is this is a greener, um, you know, almost slightly fresher version of Creed's Royal Water. If that's, well, maybe not slightly fresher, but slightly greener. Because uh, Creed's Royal Water is an extremely fresh fragrance. Um, but if you've smelled Creed's Royal Water, that is uh, really true to the Creed DNA. It has a lot of, um, Royal Water has a lot of uh, juniper berries, okay? And, and basil, and lots of citruses in, in the top. And that came out in 1997. That came out a couple years before 1872 for men. Um, and so 1872 for men, I think, kind of riffs on that green, fresh, um, you know, slightly old-fashioned masculinity, if you will. But I think Giza Schoen did a good job with this. The reason this is here is, like I said, it's coming up on the on winter, and this is really more... Uh, for me, I, I like to wear this in the dog days of summer, so this could easily have jumped the very next spot, which is going to be number one, Five Christians number one. Uh, number one in 1872, I think, could kind of go back and forth with, e with each other on the ranking, depending on my mood. Today, number one beat out 1872, but there are days where sometimes I would say, okay, this is maybe the better fragrance. It really does, is hit or miss for me, uh, depending on my mood. But uh, I, I do think it's a good fragrance. I do think it's totally overpriced. I mean, if you can find this for a, a respectable price, like 20%, 25% of the suggested retail price, I think that's fair. But don't pay what Clive Christian is asking for this. It's, uh, it's completely overkill on the price of some of these Clive Christians. But 1872 is a good fragrance. So that is at number uh, seven. Number six, so we are going to go to number one for men, and probably one of the most uh, god-awful marketing campaigns of any fragrance. So if you take a look on the front, it says, the world's most expensive perfume. How's that for marketing? And when it came out in 2001, that very well, and the cap just fell off. I don't know if you heard that, but uh, that very well may have been true that uh, it's the, the world's most expensive perfume. But uh, today, it's been outdone by many, many brands. Things like Spirit of Dubai and Rojas and stuff like that have, have well surpassed Clive Christian's number one. Um, and this is kind of a floral, powdery fragrance for men. So it's a little bit like, you know, think about things like Emouage Gold or Chanel Number no. 5 or, you know, but there's a lot of heliotrope in this fragrance. The iris note is really beautiful. It's prominent. Beautiful iris. They have used high-class materials in here. I just don't think that Patricia Cho, the perfumer, did the best job putting it all together is the thing for me. So um, I like this, uh, but I don't love it. I feel the same way about this as I do as 1872. I like it. I don't love it. The brand says, famed for its masterful balance of rare and precious ingredients, number one delivers a superlative punch of potent yet delicate notes. So um, there's bell pepper in the top with lime, tarragon, caraway, cardamom, nutmeg, grapefruit, and mandarin orange. And um, really, for me, many of those notes in the top are kind of overshadowed by the heavier floral elements that come to the forefront very quickly. So you get a lot of heliotrope, uh, which can be almost spongy in nature. You get a lot of lily of the valley, which is a very delicate flower, and you get a lot of iris and the, the jasmine, ylang ylang, and rose all kind of jump to the forefront and you get a lot of the florals up front. It does dry down to a little bit of like a woody, musky, vanillic scent. Um, the sandalwood in the base is nice. The amber in the base is nice. Uh, but I don't think it's the best blended. I just think they could have came up with something that maybe is a little bit more unique. It really feels like they're following an older style playbook uh, and they're kind of relying on the price tag to get people to 
uh, jump on something like this. However, all that being said, I do enjoy this fragrance. I don't think it's as bad as some people make it out to be. But then again, you have to kind of like the fragrances like Amouage Gold and stuff like that. Obviously, they're different fragrances. Um, but uh, yeah, the powdery, you have to enjoy those kind of powdery florals marketed towards men. So uh, that is number one for men by Clive Christian at number six. Number five is um, one of my favorite creations from the house, or from uh, Anique Minardo, who I think is uh, one of the most uh, underrated perfumers. I think she's the great Anique Minardo is how we should refer to her from here on out. She did a fragrance which I am absolutely in love with. I did a review of recently called uh, Overture Woman by M. Waj, and, and that can be worn by anyone just because it's called Overture Woman. If you're a guy, don't, uh, don't pass that up if you get a chance to sniff it. It's absolutely fantastic. I think it's her best work, actually. Uh, Overture Woman, or maybe even this one right here, which is uh, Figment Man, are, are two of her best works ever. Not just for the House of Amouage, but ever, to, to my nose. And uh, But she's done some amazing... She's done some absolutely amazing designer works. One is Body Coros for Men, which I think I accidentally forgot when we talked about the 2000 video, and then in 2001, she put out this, which is fantastic stuff. This is called O Masculin by the house of Lolita Lampica. Um, best from the house, hands down. Uh, the only thing that maybe comes close to this is they allowed her to do a flanker. They allowed Anique Minardo to come back in 2015 and do a flanker of her own work, and they called it Eau Masculin, Eau de Parfum, Intense, and they added things like Iris, uh, the, the um, Iris note in Eau Masculin, uh, Eau de Parfum, Intense is, is absolutely beautiful, and um, they really amped up the star anise note, I feel like, but the anise, uh, the, the aniseed note in Eau Masculin, Intense, if you like Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, this is a fantastic release. It's really made for colder weather, but if you like anise and masculine fragrances, even going back to things like Azaro Porom from 1978, the old school stuff, imagine bringing that to the modern forefront, making it sort of this uh, designer that modern noses would be comfortable with, and adding things like uh, rum, there's a beautiful rum note in here, but it never overpowers, mixed with uh, violet, uh, Orgeat syrup, vanilla, tonka bean, cedar, and cystus labdanum, and it's a very, even though it's sweet, even though some might consider this a gourmand, I don't consider it a gourmand necessarily, but it does have this uh, sort of uh, a little bit of a sweet take on a oriental, but I've often said the way Anique Bernardo did her designer fragrances, even on her biggest hits like Boucheron, Jaipur, uh, Jaipur, uh, Om from the House of Boucheron, you know, there's some sweet touches in there mixed with the spices, but the way she kind of used the tonka bean in the base is so different, and her her signature um, was to make a fragrance that had a little bit of sweetness, but not making it done in the disgusting sweet style that some of the other perfumers of her time started to do. It started to be like almost like a war of who could make a sweeter, sweeter fragrance with more ethyl maltol and more. And then, of course, something like Baccarat Rouge 540 came out. It's like a nuclear bomb. I hate that DNA. But I love this. This is fantastic in the cold, uh, on cold Texas days. This is so alluring, you know. And there's a dark side to this, though. There's some absinthe in the top. There's a note of ivy, which ivy's used in things like Luciano Pavarotti, one of my favorite, um, you know, celeb fragrances of all time, and, uh, but, but it's sad that this is discontinued. I wish, uh, Lolita Lempica would kind of get back on the horse and do stuff like this again, because I really think that, uh, this, there's a welcome place. There's a welcome place now for stuff like this, so happy to have what I have, but, um, but sad to see it's discontinued. So that's Lolita Lempica, O Masculin, at number five. Number four, is probably one of the most underrated uh, spicy amber fragrances of, of all time. Very few people talk about this fragrance when they talk about spicy ambers. It's from the house of uh, La Tizan Parfumer, and this is called Lo de Ambre Extreme. <laughs> Excuse me. So the original uh, Lo de Ambre 
uh, I believe came out when the brand first was launched, like within the first five years or so of the brand being launched. And then right before Jean-Claude Elena became, <coughs> excuse me, right before Jean-Claude Elena became in-house perfumer at Hermes, one of the final fragrances he made before he signed the document that would not allow him to make other perfumes for other houses is this. Uh, and this is Lo de Ombre Extreme. And, you know, when you think about spicy ambers, what comes to mind? I'll tell you that there's two that come to mind instantly for me. One is Ombre Sultan, the greatest spicy amber ever, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, it's so, so good. And then um, the next one is something like this. Andy Towers, Le du Desert Marocain. Those are two spicy ambers that are almost reference spicy ambers, if you will. And, of course, there are others. You can go check out my... Uh, this is not a top 10 amber video if you want to see others, but this, this is very, very good and almost up there. I mean, I would put it under these two, but still it should be in the conversation of some of the best spicy ambers. So he's basically used mace with nutmeg, cardamom, and pepper. And if you're familiar with mace, mace oil is kind of like this... Um, um, it's kind of like this delicate covering that goes around the nutmeg seed itself. And it has a very peppery, um, spicy, very delicate like smell. Um, slightly woody as well. Um, but that extra touch of pepper shows up here. And I think there is a pepper note in here as well, if I'm not mistaken. But it's mixed with cardamom. And the cardamom in here feels slightly green, slightly cooling, uh, and it's mixed with patchouli and Turkish rose, and, and the base is tonka, benzoin, vanilla, musk, and sandalwood. And so that amber accord that he's created, you know, Jean-Claude Elena, um, you know, he really likes soft, ethereal, almost like painting with watercolors, right? And in here, he kind of, I think, put his own ideas to the side and said, I'm going to make an extreme amber fragrance, and I'm going to do it in the style that kind of the market's asking for. And yet, he still sort of added some of Jean-Claude Elena's, his own personal touches in here, right? So, so you do get, there are some moments where it feels like some of the notes are almost like flickering in and out. And they come and go. Um, they play peekaboo on the skin. It's a fantastic amber that I really, really wish more people would talk about it. Maybe I'll try to review some of these ambers this winter once it gets cold. But... Uh, La Tizan Parfumez, L'Eau d'Ambre Extreme is number um, four on the list. Number three. Number three is a discontinued and very hard to find fragrance from the house of Michael Coors. Now, when this first came out, it was actually um, distributed by Givenchy. So, uh, Parfums Givenchy was the distributor of these Michael Coors fragrances originally, and then they changed. And Michael Coors did some... Um, they tried to realign some of the fragrances. They changed some of the fragrances. They kind of made a similar error that I feel like Dior made when they did Dior Homme 2020. They took the name of a fragrance, kept it, but changed the fragrance. And I did not like that. So the original fragrance here is called Michael for Men. So it was Michael for Men by Michael Coors. They then created a fragrance that um, was, was uh, the same name but they changed the way that it was written here at the top, right? So I think the original bottle said Michael, Michael, just like mine. You see there's no four men on there. They then put Michael for men, which I think, um, I don't know if it was reformulated or, or what ended up happening with that, but there was kind of a version in between them changing it from um, Michael Coors for men and then they, they created another Michael for men, but they had the writing come on the side, and that's a different fragrance. So it has a similar name, completely different fragrance, though. Still a good fragrance, but the original is the one that you want. I love this stuff. Uh, this is one of my favorite designer tobaccos, if you will. It has, so the way I think about this fragrance is it has some similarities to something like uh, what ended up now is, is a niche house. So if you're familiar with something like this, this is uh, Camel by the House of Zoologists. This is like a niche version of, of this to me. And um, so, so really, Michael for Men, what I really love about it 
is it takes one of my favorite notes of all time, especially when it gets cold, which is tobacco. So it takes tobacco, pipe tobacco here, and it sort of blends it with um, incense, frankincense, and suede. Okay, and you guys know I love my leathers, right? The suede here is absolutely brilliant. Actually, I think that this is one of Harry Fremont's best works. Uh, and I know he's made some amazing perfumes in his time. Tuscan leather is probably his true best work, but outside of Tuscan leather, uh, and of course he did Tom Ford's Grey Vetiver, which I like. I don't love. I don't have a bottle of it. Um, but he's done some very interesting thing. He did Noir de Noir, which I'd love to have a bottle of. But um, he did CK1. Harry Fremont's credited with doing CK1. So he's done some huge hits. But to me, this is one of my favorite works he's ever done. Because this takes this sort of somewhat likable tobacco. It's a designer style tobacco. And... Uh, mixes it with that suede note, which, uh, and and then to the coup de gras of this fragrance is it's mixed with um, dried fruits. So there's plum, and, uh, and, and the plum feels like a dark red plum. You know those plums that are kind of like um, small, but when you bite into them, the, the meat inside is almost like reddish in color, uh, almost like a very sweet plum mixed with dried fruits. So the dried fruits kind of play with the, with the, dryness of the frankincense and there's elemi in the top so the elemi in the top gives it like a lemony like an intro and there's star anise right so i was mentioning anise when we were talking about lolita lampica o masculine so there's there's a star anise note in here there's tarragon which is an old school note so the star anise tarragon in time kind of give it a little bit of an old school feel but the execution of it is modern okay and i really think harry fremont did a number on this one uh, I'm 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 really in love with this. I can't wait for it to get cold so I can wear it more. I'm gonna review it one of these days. Um, I think it deserves more love, and and I think Harry Fremont in his work deserves more love in some situations outside of just the big hits. I mean, everyone knows the Tuscan leather CK ones and stuff like that, but this deserves more love. I think the naming, the name change, and all that stuff. I think really kind of, um, I think it threw people off on this one. But uh, if you like tobacco scents and you like suede like scents, this is one of the best. Um, this, this DNA is absolutely amazing. It beat out, look, look at what it beat out. I mean, it beat out some amazing fragrances, right? So that's Michael for Men by Michael Coors. Um, the very first comment says, hidden gem. And I absolutely agree. I think it's a hidden gem for sure. Okay, number two. Number two on the list. We're going back to Clive Christian. And so we're going to probably my favorite Clive Christian outside of uh, C for Men, which is discontinued. Um, and it's kind of Clive Christian's take on Tuscan leather. But the other Clive Christian that I absolutely love is X for Men. I think X is one of the um, most classy uh, niche fragrances. And it's got, you know what it is? It's like a niche version of this. So imagine sort of this DNA, Halston Z14, right? Imagine this DNA in a in a niche packaging. And imagine you took Halston Z14 and mixed it a little bit with um, Kenzo Jungle uh, for men, right? That's also discontinued unbelievably now. But just think of the cardamom and the spices in Kenzo Jungle for men. One of the best spicy designers of the 90s. And imagine mixing it with sort of that old school Halston Z14 style, right? And coming up with something like this. And Giza Schoen in the early 2000s, you know, he was doing some very interesting work. And much of Giza Schoen's work is not to my, it's not my favorite, if you will. Uh, many stuff Giza Schoen has done, I'm not the biggest fan of. But he did a couple niche fragrances that I, I, think are worthwhile. One is Ormond Man by Ormond Jane. I really like that fragrance. The other one is this, X for Men by um, Clive Christian. He also did, probably my favorite, again, going off the beaten path, just like one of my favorite uh, Harry Fremont's is, is Michael for Men, which hardly no one talks about. My favorite Giza Showen fragrance is called Kinski by Kinski, and that came out 11 years ago. No one talks about that, but it's an animalic, spicy, cannabis, castorium, it's an insane fragrance. Um, lots of labdanum and suede. There's a suede note in there as well. I'll review Kinski by Kinski. That's backup bottle worthy. It's so good. Impossible to find. Absolutely impossible. 
took an act of God to get a bottle on my doorstep. But um, I'm a huge fan of Kinski for men. That's my favorite Giza showing. Um, it really showcases his uh, skill set better than any of these do. But you have to be a little bit of a rebel and an outlaw, which I am. I mean, hell, I'm a Raider fan. You have to be a rebel to suffer through being a Raider fan. Um, but, uh, you know, if you're more of a, hey, I want to wear my fragrances to the office and I don't want people to look at me like something is wrong, you know, I don't want to be the one wearing the crazy out of left field fragrances, which I love, this is the one I'd recommend. I think this is the uh, most suave and elegant of all of Giza Schoen's work. X for Men kind of takes that DNA of Halston Z14 and modernizes it. So there's a beautiful green cardamom, um, pink pepper, which is a very modern, you know, pink pepper is kind of one of those ubiquitous notes. You see it in a lot of niche fragrances nowadays, and it gets overlooked, but it does add this suaveness to it and ginger. And ginger adds this zing, right? So it's like a little bit of bergamot, uh, ginger, and green cardamom. And green cardamom is my favorite type of cardamom. And it's mixed with that cinnamon. So, you know, if you're a fan of cinnamon heavy fragrances, Z14 to me is a cinnamon heavy fragrance. Sometimes some say, some people say Z14 has a little bit of a big red cinnamon like smell. The cinnamon in here uh, is a little bit of a throwback to Z14, but there's a lot of other things going on. And there's um, orris root, okay, Egyptian jasmine, and violet in here. And the base is cedarwood, oak moss, tree moss, vetiver, and vanilla. So don't worry too much about the vanilla. It's not too sweet. It just adds a little bit of uh, a softener for that cinnamon. And But what it really dries down to is a brilliant woody fragrance. This is a spicy woody fragrance for men that just has a little bit of greenness from the green cardamom, just has a little bit of sweetness from the vanilla, but it has this very suave personality. You know, this is, many people say this is like James Bond's fragrance, and I can completely see why. There's definitely uh, a smooth, this is a smooth operator fragrance, if you will. It used to be called X for Men. Now it's called X, the masculine perfume of the perfect pair. I have no clue what the hell Clive Christian is doing. But um, needless to say, it is a, a brilliant fragrance. I think it works all year round. Many people say this is a cold weather fragrance. I think it works all year round. Um, the um, the I don't know if it's necessarily worth the insane prices that Clive Christian asked for. Many of their fragrances are outrageous. Um, you know, many of them are so overpriced, it's ridiculous. But uh, this one, I think, is one of the few that, um, you know, maybe it's not worth the price tag, but it's worth maybe trying to hunt down at a discounted rate. So Clive Christian, X for men. And Clive Christian says X is a singular... A singular blend of extracts sourced from the furthest corners of the world. Ah. Fine-tuned for the purposes of today's modern explorer. Well, so if you go exploring, uh, you know you can wear Clive Christian's X for Men. And so that leaves only number one. And if you know the year 2001, you know there's even, there's no doubt this is number one in my mind. Speaking of tobacco fragrances, as good as Michael is, it really can't hold a candle to this for me. This is one of my favorite tobaccos of all time. It is Shaggy. So Shaggy is kind of like a hype beast from the house of Serge Luton on YouTube. Many people way back in the day when YouTube was, uh, you know, YouTube fragrance reviews were uh, not being done by uh, you know, these good looking women who don't really know anything about fragrances, but instantly get 50,000 views because they kind of look good. Uh, and they dress a little provocatively on their reviews, right? Back when YouTube reviews were done by reviewers who actually cared about fragrances, this was one of the hype beasts back in the day. And rightly so. This deserved to be hyped, actually. Um, like I said, it's one of my favorite tobacco fragrances of all time. It takes this sort of idea of hay and iris, and the iris is so high class in here. Uh, it's slightly powdery and a little bit of rose, and it mixes it with incense and this beautiful honeyed amber note. Um, so imagine like a beeswax, and it all sits on a brilliant sandalwood base, okay? So to me, 
Tobacco kind of shares some elements of hay. You've ever smelled hay absolute, which thanks to Russian Adam, I was able to smell some of the absolutes of the ingredients that go in many of these perfumes. So I've smelled hay absolute and I've compared it with tobacco absolute and they definitely share some similarities. Um, the hay feels a little more like you're maybe out in the field. The tobacco feels a little bit more like you're smelling the um, foil of like a cigarette package if you've ever pulled that foil before you can actually get the cigarette out you know what I'm talking about if you smelled that uh, it has a little bit more of that papery dry tobacco like smell but um, this is a Serge Luton through and through I mean this is um, to me this is the type of fragrance that puts Christopher Sheldrake up there with Olivier Polge and Antoine Lee and you know those kind of guys as the best perfumer still still doing it right now there's a lot of great perfumers who retired um, but it, I guess if you still count Jean-Claude Elena is still doing it since he just had the new Frederick Mall release, which I've yet to smell, heaven can wait. But, um, you know, if you count Jean-Claude Elena, you'd have to say Jean-Claude Elena, Christopher Sheldrake, um, Antoine Lee, um, Olivier Polge. I mean, those are kind of the best of the best who are still doing it. I don't know if Carlos Benaim is still doing it anymore, if he's still working, but, um, Fragrances like this, for me, put Christopher Sheldrake up there as one of the all-time great perfumers, and, and what a fragrance he created here. Um, so if you're a fan of tobacco, very smooth, it's very suave, again, very smooth. These two tobaccos that came out in 2001, they're smooth operator tobaccos. You know, there are obviously harsher, um, drier, deeper, richer tobaccos, which I also enjoy wearing. Uh, I did a review of Fumari Turk from the same house. I love a bottle of Fumari Turk. It's, if you said, Ramsey, you can have one Serge Luton fragrance that you don't have in your collection, a full bottle of. What do you want? Fumari Turk would probably be it. Although Queer Moresque is kind of right there. Those two, Queer Moresque and Fumari Turk are the two from Serge that are at the top of my wish list. Uh, but this is a very smooth operator tobacco. Everything is kind of uh, slightly powdery, but smoothed out. And um, just a brilliant, brilliant. I mean, it's like, um, it's like really once the weather starts to turn, imagine going to like a pumpkin patch or taking a hay ride and sitting on the back of a tractor and you're going through a cornfield. You ever seen those cornfield mazes when you go to family events like a pumpkin patch or something like that? This is really kind of what, this is the smell that I imagine myself wearing when I go to something like that. Shergi is fall in a bottle for me. It's absolutely perfection. And, um, you know, this is the very first comment on, uh, on, on base notes says that this reached cult status. And I absolutely agree. This does this, this absolutely does feel like it is a cult fragrance, but rightly so. I mean, when you think of the most hyped Serge Luton fragrances, this is one of them. Uh, especially when you when you uh, look on YouTube, I don't think anything was hyped more from the brand of Serge Luton than Shergi, but it's rightly so. Uh, I, I believe many of the modern stuff that you see hyped, I completely disagree with. This is one, if you go back to the old school hypes, I do agree with. I absolutely love Shergi, so just a brilliant, brilliant fragrance. Um, so that's my list, that's my top 11, and my honorable mention with La Occitan Vetiver. Uh, hope you enjoyed uh, kind of the ramble, uh, bringing us back, setting our, you know, headspace back to the year 2001. And of course, my scent of the day, I'm still working up the courage to review opium. I mean, I can just, oh, it's just so beautiful. One of the most beautiful fragrances I've ever smelled in my life, uh, vintage opium, Charles of the Ritz. So one of these days, I'll do a Hall of Fame review on that. But uh, let me know what your favorites are from 2001. Obviously, there are still some that are not on the list, if you will, um, that I'm still kind of hunting down. So uh, a lot of things from 2001 I, I, I've never smelled yet. I haven't smelled anything. There's a lot of uh, histoires de parfums that I've still yet to smell, like 1826. And um, there's a couple others, 1876, 1873. I've never smelled any of those. Also, Cologne Bigarade by Frederick Maul. I have yet to smell that, believe it or not. Uh, I hear it has some similarities with Eau de Hermes, which does not surprise me since, of course, Jean-Claude Elena was so 
influenced by his master Edmund Rudnitska. So there's still a bunch of stuff from, you know, 2001 I would love to smell. But let me know what your favorites are from 2001. Love seeing your faces in the comments. Thanks for the support, everyone. I really do appreciate it. Uh, thanks for liking the videos and all the stuff that you guys do, you know, um, giving, giving it a thumbs up if, if you're into that kind of thing. It, it is very much appreciated. So cheers, guys. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.